Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference channel. My name is Jesse Day. We are bringing you our expert series of panels each and every week. And we've got a great one lined up for you today. We've got Jack Gamble of the Nobody Special Finance YouTube channel and Mario Maneko of the Maneko 64 channel. Very excited to get these two gentlemen back together as their last panel was the most popular to date on the channel. People really enjoyed it. So gentlemen, it's great to have you both back on for round two. Thank you, Jesse. Appreciate it. Thank you, so, Jesse. Yeah, it's it's going to be a ton of fun, and I can't wait to hear what you guys have to say about the topics I'm going to be discussing today. I want to start with the broad market, um, because the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ continue to grind to new all-time highs with a few blips along the way here and there. It's been quite a while now that many people have been calling for a crash in the broad market Depending on who you talk to, it can be as much as 90% if you speak with somebody like Harry Dent uh, to a 20 to 30% for somebody on the more conservative side of things. I wonder what your thoughts are on the state of where the markets are at at present. Is this a bubble or is this the new era of AI innovation and a bull market with legs? And Jack, I'll start with you. In my opinion, to call this a bubble uh, would not be fair to bubbles. All right, this is over and above a bubble. Um, I, I want there's a famous quote from the dot com bubble from the CEO of Sun Microsystems, the former CEO, uh, called "What Were You Thinking?" It's a pretty long quote. I won't get it exactly right, but at the time, or shortly, this was shortly after Sun Microsystems had crashed, and they were trading at ten times sales at the peak. And Scott McNeely had a famous quote, and he said, "Let's just assume for a second that I could get past." my board of directors to pay 100% of revenue in the form of dividends to my shareholders. And then let's assume I had no bills, no rent, no electric, no payroll, no taxes, no nothing, that every dollar the company took in, I could pay out in dividends to my shareholders. It would still take 10 years at 10 times sales for those shareholders to break even on what they were paying for my stock. And then he says, this, this is a very profound quote, a CEO saying to his own shareholders, what were you thinking when you paid 10 times sales for my company? Right? That was Sun Microsystems at 10 times sales. Right now, NVIDIA is trading at 37 times sales. All right. So if 10 times sales is what were you thinking, then I don't know what you call NVIDIA at 37 times sales. And look, I, I get a lot of criticism because I've been very, very adamant about the AI mania really going all the way back to August of last year. And of course, the mania has continued. It has further inflated. NVIDIA shares are now pushing almost $1,000. Their numbers that they have reported quarter after quarter have been phenomenal. But if you peel back and you look beyond what just the headline numbers are, you can see a lot of very similar overlaps with the dot-com bubble. In particular, what I've been drawing attention to on my channel is a phenomenon called round tripping where NVIDIA makes strategic investments in their own customers. They you know, very famously $2.3 billion to core weave back in, in the, I believe it was third quarter of last year, second quarter of last year. Core weave borrowed $2.3 billion, a line of credit. They took investments from Magnetar Capital, from NVIDIA themselves. All of this money that NVIDIA invests in their customers, their customers turn around and hand that right back to NVIDIA to buy their chips. Now that's not illegal. Um, vendor financing, if you want to call it, or strategic investments in your customers isn't against the law. But when you do it to such an extent, it becomes misleading to your shareholders. And it starts to question how valid is this growth? And NVIDIA is not being valued based on sales. NVIDIA is being valued based on its growth or its rate of change of sales. So they have an incentive to pull forward as much demand as they can in order to make the growth seem bigger so that they can get these bigger and bigger valuations. And in the last quarter, the fourth quarter of last year, NVIDIA made 11 investments or strategic investments in 11 of their customers. And all of that money is coming right back in the form of revenue. And it looks like organic revenue growth, but it's not real. It's just NVIDIA's own cash moving in circles. And, you know, I've been trying to draw attention to this. You know, it's it's screaming into a, an angry crowd because everybody's making money on this stock. Everybody in the world, um, none of the analysts that cover it would dare say anything bad about it. Out of 38 analysts who cover NVIDIA, 36 have a buy, two have a hold. 
one cell at 37 times sales because they're all afraid of being the only one. That's groupthink. That's a psychological phenomenon where people self-censor and stop telling the truth because they're afraid of being the only one, i.e. the emperor has no clothes. Every fund manager on Wall Street is piling into NVIDIA stock because they're afraid of being the only fund that isn't. So nobody's buying, nobody's buying the company. Everybody's buying the story. And the story is based on, I don't want to say a lie, but at the very least, dishonest accounting. And I would add that, you know, a lot of people say, no way could a, could a fraud ever get this big. You know, NVIDIA is too big. In, NVIDIA has a documented history of, of accounting fraud going all the way back to 2000 when their CFO uh, settled with the SEC while admitting no wrongdoing, of course, that they created that they artificially inflated their earnings by 15% in one of the quarters of 2000 by cutting two separate deals with their suppliers in order to inflate their revenues in one quarter while suppressing the cost of goods sold. It was dishonest accounting and Nvidia stock crashed 50% after that happened. Uh, Jensen Wong was CEO of the company when that happened. And so either Jensen Wong did not know that his CFO had artificially inflated earnings by 15%, which I doubt it. How could how could a guy like Jensen Wan not know that? So then the alternative would be that he knew and he took no action to stop it or correct it, which means he was complicit in it. Either way, it's not good optics for NVIDIA. And everybody has conveniently forgotten about this history because, well, they're all making money on the stock. It's not going to end well. Very interesting. I was not aware, aware of that history of deception previously with NVIDIA. And yeah, I think all of what you say makes a lot of sense. This just seems like such a classic case of of mania. Uh, Mario, what are your thoughts on on the current action of the broad market? Do you think there is a correction on the horizon? I agree uh, with what Jack uh, said, most, most of it. The other uh, point I would add, because I'm more of a macro uh, thinker, even though uh, I was uh, reading yesterday, I dusted off security analysis by Benjamin Graham, and he said some really interesting things about the 1920s that they had a bubble too, and it was a mania. And he was writing that in 1934. And that always happens when you have loose uh, money, loose monetary policy. And I think that's what people are forgetting. Um, and uh, last week, uh, was really important as well because uh, Jay Powell said he was going to slow down QT. And we saw the Swiss National Bank cutting rates. We're seeing the Bank of England uh, saying that they're going to cut soon, even though they're not at their target 2% CPI. So I, I think in a world where uh, the currency uh, by which all these securities, uh, stocks, uh, are or even bonds are priced in, uh, the currencies are going down in value at a rate of knots. Uh, yeah, does it is it really uh, uh, surprising? It's not surprising to me to, to see the stock market going up. Whether it will correct, uh, it could. But what what if uh, the Fed start starts cutting rates at its next meeting? What if they s stop QT? They could very well stop QT. I think people were surprised that they announced, uh, Jay Powell announced last week that he was going to slow it down. So I, I, I see it more as, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> as the currency lose value. And uh, Jack had spoke to me about NVIDIA. Uh, but one thing I would say, the, the I think this market, the stock market, even though uh, everything seems to be an all-time high, there's a lot of companies out there, I think, if you do your research, that are uh, very undervalued, not just in the mining sector, but others as well. So this is like a, a stock picker's market. But if we do have a correction, I think uh, all uh, stocks will suffer. Yeah, so that's how I see it. Uh, back back uh, during the uh, collapse of the Venezuelan Bolivar, uh, the Caracas Stock Exchange is doing well. Back during the 1920s, uh, German stocks were doing well, but... Uh, uh, I think uh, what's going to happen is that the currencies are going to drop uh, faster than stocks are going up. And uh, that's why I hold on to my gold and silver. Yes, that is a very important point to note that countries who've undergone hyperinflation have had the stock markets perform extremely well at that point. Zimbabwe, another example of that. 
Um, let's talk about gold here since you brought it up. It continues its strong performance into the year, sitting just above $2,200 right now, uh, maintaining a new all-time high. However, it is not near all-time highs if we adjust for inflation. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the gold market at present. And is this bull market in gold just getting started? Mario, I'll start with you on this one. Yeah, and uh, I don't really look at it in terms of uh, adjusted for inflation, but I would argue it would probably be even higher if you use the uh, the way they calculated uh, CPI back in 1980. But um, yeah, I mean, and this is not about the dollar or it, it's about all fiat currencies because we're seeing uh, gold go up uh, to all-time highs in every major currency, even the Swiss franc. Today, we're trading above 2,000 francs for the first time. So yeah, it's pointing to that. And uh, one good thing, I think, for uh, people who are bullish on gold and bearish on fiat currencies is there there seems to be very little excitement and very little uh, froth or, yeah, right now, mainly because the stock market is still doing really well and we've got... Uh, the other, the game in the crypto market also detracting a lot of people. And it's a good when people like Larry Fink say that gold is not really uh, useful. But on the other hand, he, he thinks Bitcoin is a good thing. So uh, yeah, the fundamentals are great and the uh, technicals look really good. I uh, tweeted earlier today or posted on X a chart of gold going back maybe... Uh, 25 years and uh, comparing it to the price of gold in uh, paper marks in, in the 1920s. And it looks very similar. And uh, the worrying thing for uh, people who hold on to fiat currency is that uh, we're at a juncture uh, back in that looks very much like just when the, the, the price of gold in marks was taking off. Uh, around 1922. So yeah, that's the way I see gold. Uh, silver, I guess we can talk about that later. But yeah, I'm uh, I'm bullish on gold. It doesn't mean though that uh, we can't see a lot of volatility still. And it's more the fiat currencies that are volatile, I would say. Yeah, interesting comparison there with Weimar Germany. Fascinating. Jack, what are your thoughts on the gold market at present? From what I've seen in gold, it, it does very well anticipating inflation, not necessarily so well during the inflation. Like case in point, the, the most recent few years, gold performed phenomenally in 2020. And though CPI actually, we had negative CPI prints for a while in 2020 there. That was during peak transitory, right? Now, maybe inflation goes up a little bit, but we think it'll be transitory. Gold was rocketing, anticipating that inflation that the market knew the Fed had just unleashed with its quantitative easing and all the asset buying that it did during the pandemic. And then, of course, the inflation did arrive late in 2021, all through 22 and the first half of 23. And gold performed, actually, it, it underperformed during the high inflation, but it did very well ahead of it. And I think what gold is telling us right now is there's a second wave on the horizon. And if you think about it, we've got asset bubble again see earlier comments about the bubble here but we've got assets virtually across the board at all-time highs pretty much commercial real estate is the only thing that isn't an all-time high everything else is and yet we're talking about rate cuts we're talking about ending qt here we're talking about a dovish shift in monetary policy and so gold knows hey when you have the other central banks and you've already got loose monetary conditions and you've already got an, an asset bubble. Well, it's not too hard to imagine what's going to happen there. And also inflation moves in a very predictable pattern. It starts in assets and then it hits consumer prices. And then lastly, it hits wages. And we've already seen the first indications of that second wave of inflation with the asset prices rising all through 23 and into the beginning of this year. So I think gold right now is telling us there's a second wave of consumer inflation on the horizon and central banks are backing that up with their dovish pivot recently. And where does this all leave silver? Mario, you released a video on your channel a couple weeks back called Silver Could Be Ready to Shock the World. Expand on your findings in that video for us. And then, Jack, I'd like to get your thoughts as well. Yeah, it's just that I compared it to uh, the long-term price of uh, 
Coco. And Coco has, has gone crazy the last year from about, uh, below $3,000 uh, a ton. I think yesterday it closed at nine and a half thousand. And, and up until uh, a year ago, uh, Coco was trading within like a, a like a triangle like silver has been since 2021 or thereabouts. And uh, as I said, the chart going back to like the early 70s is very similar, um, despite the fact that uh, high in 2011, Coco didn't get up as high as the one in 1980. But they, and I think uh, technical analysis sometimes is important. And I, I saw that this morning someone uh, posted on on Twitter or X that uh, Robusta coffee is made uh, an all time high, not the New York coffee, but and I think uh, it's just a symptom of all that um, funny money out there or funny currency. And uh, the problem with silver right now is that it seems to be, yeah, it, it should be a lot higher with gold where it is. But uh, I, I think what uh, the bullion banks are doing, and some people don't think the bullion banks care about precious metals, but they have half a trillion derivatives, just the U.S. bank in precious metals. I think what they're doing um, right now is that they're using silver to keep gold from going much higher because technically, if you look at the long term of gold, uh, chart of gold, it's really broken out. Uh, there's no nothing above here. So they have to try to uh, stop gold from going up too quickly. So they're they're uh, putting um, you know tamping down silver, but I don't think it will. Uh, they'll be able to do it forever because just like uh, gold, there's a lot of demand uh, not just from uh, China for silver, but also from India. So I think uh, again, patience is important. Uh, people who have been patient with gold have been rewarded, and I think they will be rewarded with silver too. And yes, sentiment very low across the sector right now when it comes to both the metal and especially silver miners too. Um, Jack, does this low sentiment potentially present a buying opportunity? Are you bullish on silver moving forward? How do you see things playing out? So I am bullish on silver overall in general. Um, silver, arguably the most undervalued asset in the world with the asterisk, every asset in the world is overvalued. So you know, you got to view it through that lens. Um, silver is somewhat unique in that it is 50-50 in monetary metal versus an industrial metal. And, you know, here we sit with gold at all-time highs, and yet silver is only about half of its all-time high. I mean, it is up over the last few months, but it's up modestly while gold has been rocketing. I think silver has something of an industrial problem right now. A lot of the manufacturing PMIs have been pretty lousy for the better part of a year and a half now. Uh, the global trade is slowing. Global economies and you know production in China is slowing. We've got things like uh, the EV bubble. I, I heard a lot of silver advocates were talking a lot about, oh, all the silver we're going to need for electric cars and for solar panels. Right. And I've took a little bit of heat from the PM community all along saying, guys, these things are green fantasies. They're never going to happen on any kind of a significant scale to make a dent in fossil fuel consumption. Um, even right now, as we heavily subsidize electric vehicle manufacturing in this country through the Inflation Reduction Act and a lot of the, the subsidies that are going on there, EV companies are reducing their prices, they're reducing their production numbers. So I think there was a, a little bit of hyperbolic rhetoric by the in the PM community about solar and EVs, and that's kind of taken a bit of a reality check here. But you've got other things like consumer electronics in the United States have been flat for the last four years. Uh, people just can't afford consumer electronics anymore because the cost of inflation, food, rent, housing, you know, fuel, the the things you need are so expensive that the things you want, you can't afford anymore. And so that's starting to hit silver demand on the industrial supply or on the industrial side, even as the monetary demand is very strong because of currency debasement. And so you've got headwinds and tailwinds acting against each other. I think that is holding back some of silver's potential here. Um, that being said, if we do get a return to easy money and if we do get a return of low interest rates and we get stimmies again and they start helicopter money, you know, those electronic sales are going to go up. All that industrial demand is going to come surging back and silver is going to outperform everything else because 
it has largely sat out this rally. So overall, I'm bullish silver. I do think, you know, 10 years from now, silver is going to be much, much higher than it is right now. But I think it's the industrial side that's holding it back here. What's up, guys? Quick break. My name is Jay Martin. I'm the CEO of Cambridge House and the host of the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference. I wanted to quickly point your attention to a link right beneath this video where you can subscribe to our new weekly newsletter. If you want to better understand the minds of the best investors in the resource space, subscribe to this newsletter. I author it personally every Sunday and I love writing it. Hit that link below to subscribe. All right, back to the interview. Yeah, I love taking that long-term approach. And I definitely echo your sentiments when it comes to the green revolution and all the attention that's being placed on silver use and solar panels and EVs. I basically discount that from the thesis whenever I consider silver, but I'm a long-term holder. As, as you said, 10 years from now, it's going to be worth a lot more. Um, and a great way, as, as is gold, to remove your wealth from the traditional financial system and get it out of the hands of counterparty risk. Um, let's shift over to Japan for a moment here because the Japanese yen has now hit its lowest level versus the U.S. dollar since 1990. And Finance Minister Suzuki announced in response to this development, we are watching market moves with a high sense of urgency. We will take bold measures against excessive moves without ruling out any options. This sounds like things are getting desperate. Um, Japan obviously has the largest debt to GDP of any nation on earth. Maybe some of them that don't report it, like North Korea maybe has higher debt to GDP, but basically of all the developed nations, it's Japan. Is this an isolated case, what they're going through right now? Do you think this is a an effect of, as Mario, you were pointing out, the funny currency circulating throughout the world at this moment. Could Japan be the first domino to fall in regards to developed nations getting into more and more real economic trouble? And Jack, I'll start with you on this one. So the interesting thing, I do think Japan is something of an isolated case because they're just so far out there on monetary policy, right? With the yield curve control and the negative rate policy, the rest of the world is coming down off of a hiking cycle. Japan is just starting theirs. So Japan is in a vacuum here with, with their policy. Uh, what, what I think happened in the last week or so, we finally got the first rate hike from Japan. I, I believe it was the first one in like 15 or 20 years. Uh, but let's look at what it really was. They, they raised rates from negative 0.1 to zero. Whoa, buddy, you know, slow down, right? And, and everybody was expecting this to start on day one when Ueda took over for Kota over at the uh, Bank of Japan last year. And then, of course, the U.S. had a banking crisis, so Japan got a little trigger shy, and they waited a year. And when they finally came around, it's this weak sauce, 10 basis point rate hike. The world yawns at it, and the and the yen starts to collapse against the dollar because it was too little, way too late. And so Japan, that was the market telling Japan, like, let's get this done already. You're taking way too long on this hiking cycle. Now, my biggest concern with Japan is what Japan does and the effect it has outside of Japan, not necessarily what happens within Japan. They are the third largest economy in the world, but I think they have an outsized effect on the US and China. In particular, it's the spread between interest rates in Japan and the US. As that spread closes, that could be a big risk for US markets because Japan is raising rates and we're about to start lowering them. And there's something called the yen carry trade that's been very prominent in finance for decades. It's about a $20 trillion market where you can go into Japan where they had negative interest rates or low interest rates. You can borrow yen for almost nothing. You can convert those yen into dollars, and then you can buy U.S. assets, either U.S. treasuries that are yielding 5%, or you could buy U.S. stocks, which are mooning, bubble, all that other stuff, while paying almost no interest on that yen debt. And so you're carrying that debt in yen while buying assets in dollars, the yen carry trade. There's about $20 trillion of that going on. Now, as the spread between dollar interest rates and yen interest rates closes, the arbitrage opportunity for that yen carry trade starts to starts to thin out, or if not disappear outright, especially if the U.S. comes back to zero interest rate policy. So an unwind of the yen carry trade could cause real big problems for U.S. asset values as firms start to sell their U.S.-based assets to get the dollars to convert back into yen to pay back that yen carry trade. So if they're not careful, that it could cause a stampede for the exits from US assets to cover that yen debt that's now becoming more expensive. It's not a problem yet, 
because it was only 10 basis points and the, the gap between U.S. rates and Japanese rates is still huge. But now you've got two central banks moving in opposite directions towards each other. So that could close that gap pretty quick. And the other thing to worry about is, you know, the last time Japan intervened in their currency market was in 2022, and it was right about this level. You know, the way Jap Japan could support their currency would be selling U.S. treasuries to get dollars so they could sell those dollars to prop up the value of the yen. Well, that would put down pressure on U.S. bond prices, upward pressure on U.S. interest rates. Heading into an election year, you know, when Japan did that back in 2022, Janet Yellen kind of tacitly signed off on it. Um, I'm not so sure the U.S. would be so willing to bless that off in a presidential election year or not. So Japan is kind of a dark horse in this race. They could make a mess of things this year, depending on what the central banks do. And Mary, your thoughts on the developments going on in Japan right now. As an interesting side note, those people who are holding gold right now are doing very well versus the Japanese yen. Um, but Mario, how, how do you see this situation developing moving forward? Do you see this potentially presenting risk outside of Jap Japan as well? Yeah, I, I've covered the yen carry trade uh, many times on my channel. I even have a playlist, so I won't go over it again because Jack went over it really well. Uh, one thing I have to say about the uh, decision last week by uh, Ueda and the Bank of Japan was it was very timid, like Jack said, from minus 0.1 to zero. And uh, yes, they're doing yield curve control, as but they're also still doing QE. They announced... $40 billion of QE a month. And if you translate that into the size of uh, the equivalent for the US, for example, you just take the uh, US GDP and see how much bigger it is. And in Japan, I did the calculation. It's uh, as if it, it's if uh, the Fed were doing $250 billion QE a, a month. So uh, I, I think this is just talk uh, by the Bank of Japan. I don't think they're going to change anything significantly. And uh, even though Japan has a great, great export sector, and I think the Japanese people, uh, they're very stoic and they'll they'll take things, you know, a, a lot more than us in the West. So I, I think, uh, unfortunately, the path for the yen is uh, lower because the yen carry trade is up. One of the conditions for it to succeed is that uh, the yen keeps uh, weak. And uh, I, I don't think the Bank of Japan wants a, a strong yen. Yeah, they're going to talk. The finance minister said that they're keeping an eye on it. But I, I think it's just, for, it's just talk. That's all it is. They might do a few interventions. But in the end of the day, they're, they're going to keep uh, policy uh you know, uh, accommodative as possible, uh, because they're <laughs> and there's no no way out for them. They've got three hundred percent of GDP in, in, in uh, debt, and half of that is owned by the Bank of Japan. They can't sell that. There's no no buyers out there. So, yeah, I, I, I'd say to uh, my Japanese uh, viewers and I have some anti Japanese people in general, hold on to your gold and maybe even some silver. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a great point about the attitude of most Japanese people, the the stoicism, the willingness to suffer in silence before taking any sort of, uh, you know, whether that be rioting if things ever got crazy or even protesting is something that is very uncommon there. Um, so I definitely see the situation getting worse before it gets better. And yes, holding onto precious metals is a great idea anywhere, but especially if you live in that part of the world. Let's expand further and kind of get an overview of the geopolitical landscape from both of your views, particularly in regards to the conflicts that um, are continuing around the globe at the moment. Obviously, the Russia-Ukraine war, Israel-Hamas, U.S. is placing more troops in Taiwan at the moment, Haiti essentially becoming gang controlled, at least if you believe everything the media is saying. There's a civil war raging in Sudan. Um do you see this trend rising? I mean, I believe the IDF has now launched a bunch of strikes in Syria as well. I think that was reported on today or yesterday, um, although that's kind of an ongoing issue as well. Lebanon, too. I mean, do you see this trend rising? And, and how does this all play out in your view? And uh, Mario, I'll go to you first on this one. 
Yeah, and I, I would add another uh, conflict that is going on under the radar a little bit, and and that's the uh, uh, fight, the struggle for dominance of uh, what they call the Sahel uh, corridor in Africa, which is uh, a place between the 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 Sahara Desert and the Sub-Saharan Tropics, and that's where Timbuktu used to be, and, and they're mostly like uh, old French colonies, and the French still have. Well, they're losing a lot of power there, and it's and basically the the Russians are financing uh, all these uh, overthrows and coups there, and there's loads of uranium and, and precious metals in these areas. So I think that that's going to continue there. That's something a, a little bit under the radar, and is it maybe uh, maybe that's why uh, Macron has been so hawkish towards Russia. Who knows? But for the other conflicts, Haiti. Uh, I remember watching, I think last year, a, a video by an uh, Indigo Traveler on YouTube. He's really good. And he was in Haiti. And it is. Haiti is like, um, it's anarchy, basically. The government has very little power. And you have different gangs that have arms that have been shipped in from the United States, not surprisingly. And uh, yes, they control uh, petrol, you know, the fuel. Uh, it, it's a really bad uh, situation people are starving so uh, that's another potential for more refugees or Ill illegals to come over to the u.s or maybe even go to uh, places like uh, mexico uh, or even south america who knows because uh, any country uh, looks better than uh, haiti uh, the way it is as for the other uh, conflicts yeah i, I think it's only going to get worse because mainly because the West, uh, our currencies are going down the drain, got too much debt. And uh, usually uh, that's what happens at, at the end of uh, an empire. There's a lot of conflicts, people fighting for resources everywhere. So I don't think it's going to stop, unfortunately. And Jack, your thoughts on expanding global conflict and how you see this all potentially coming to an end, is it going to get worse before it gets better? You know, sadly, I see the world is almost on autopilot towards towards World War III at this point. You know, I, we, we've got these regional conflicts in Eastern Europe and the Middle East. And, you know, the, you, you've, you've kind of always had some conflict to some extent in the Middle East. Um, this is the biggest European conflict now we've seen since World War II. Obviously, the South China Sea is a a big risk as well. Uh, it seems like Eastern leaders want a third world war, and it seems like Western leaders want a third world war. Unfortunately, I mean, even, you know, we were just talking about Japan and their debt to GDP. Well, Japan is ramping up defense spending like we haven't seen since World War II. They're fielding aircraft carriers for the first time now. I mean, I think they're calling them helicopter destroyers, but they're, they're aircraft carriers. They can accommodate US F-35Bs. Uh, you've got Japan is putting missile bases in the Senkaku Islands, all gearing towards intervention in a Taiwan conflict. And this is Japan, who has been very much a pacifist country since the end of World War II, or is now taking a very defensive, um, aggressive posture here. You know, you could argue whether or not it's Chinese aggression is driving that, you know, and there's back and forth on both sides there. But the fact is, you've got a formerly very pacifist nation is now taking a very aggressive approach here. And we're seeing that across the whole world. Um, and in my opinion, the single biggest risk is the collapse of the Chinese housing market when it comes towards sparking that conflict. And, you know, the the story with Taiwan, that's been there for 70 years. That's nothing new. It's not going away anytime soon. But the difference now is this is number one, China is finally in a position militarily to do something about it, or at least they're getting there. And number three, this this economic calamity we've seen what oppressive governments do when times get tough at home. They start wars to deflect public anger outward. And China is in, you know, I was talking about bubbles earlier with the AI bubble. And again, you know, speaking of the everything bubble, real estate values in China are at just obscene levels of valuation. And now we're watching it collapse in real time. Um, you know, I just saw the story today that uh, Country Garden is uh, withdrawing their guidance or, you know, 
who knows what's going on with Country Garden today? That story is just developing. I can tell you that they use the same auditor, Price Waterhouse Cooper, Cooper, who previously signed off on Evergrande's books. Whoops, seventy-eight billion dollar fraud and over, going on over there. Uh, and when things get bad at home, dictators start wars. And I'm worried that the Chinese housing collapse and a potential banking crisis could make public anger in China such a problem that the Chinese, not to capture any tactical objective or anything like that, start the war just to maintain control of their own population and deflect that anger outward. So, yeah, I do see it getting worse before it gets better, Jesse. Yes, and in China, you know, protesting carries a great risk with it of potentially losing your life depending on on how things go down um we did see actual protests occurring in in the depths of the very harsh lockdown restrictions that took place in that country apparently a lot of those people who protested went missing after as well but that just shows how desperate they were that they were willing to risk their life and their freedom um so i i if that situation plays out again then then perhaps a war in in the minds of the government would make sense um i'll close by opening the floor to both of you to talk about anything we haven't covered that you think it's important for investors to be paying attention to right now and jack i'll throw this to you first so we've seen stock bubbles in the dot com and then we've seen real estate bubbles go up in the gfc and right now we have parallels to both of those scenarios right we, we i just talked about the ai mania and all of the suspicious at some degrees outright fraud and other areas going on in ai mania that's eerily reminiscent of the dot-com bubble and now we've got commercial real estate, which we didn't talk too much about, but it seems like every day there's another half dozen stories about some building that is selling for hundreds of millions of dollars less than it sold for just three or four years ago. And this is happening in every city and every country across the planet. So we've got a major real estate asset bubble and a major securities tech bubble going on simultaneously in the same space. And this is following a period of the largest monetary expansion the world has ever seen because of COVID. Every central bank in the world was doing some form of QE. Uh, there is no precedent for this. All right. What happens when the dot-com bubble and the GFC happens at the same time? We may be able to find out. Now, I don't know that the manipulation of derivatives in commercial real estate really rises to the level of what we saw with the CDOs and the credit default swaps in the GFC. Um, but I think what's going on securities in the AI mania more than compensates for that. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of people out there who are trying to say it's the best economy ever. The crash bros and the bears have been wrong. Well, you know, speculative asset bubbles are funny like that. They go up, they, they reach seemingly unbelievable valuations and there's no telling how high they go, but we all know where they go in the long run. They go straight down. That is going to come eventually. I don't know how high it can go before then. I mean, NVIDIA stock seems like it's on autopilot for $1,000 a share. For all I know, it's hit $1,000 a share while we were talking just because the market's open. Uh, but at some point, it correct. we've seen this before. And I just think this market, this, my friend Samantha LaDuke referred to it as an unserious market recently. Um, we know how this is going to end. And I think we are going to be the laughing stock of financial history when people look back at what we were paying for things at this point in time. And we're going to have a lot of explaining to do to future generations. Yes, history does seem to be repeating itself in that sense. And the overvaluations in the market at present seem blindingly obvious if you're paying attention to fundamentals, which few people seem to be. Um, but I'm glad that I have guys like you uh, as a voice of reason amidst this chaos. And uh, Mario, what, what do you have on your mind that we haven't discussed so far that you think uh, it's important for people to to pay attention to? Yeah, I would just add something to what Jack said about the commercial real estate. Uh, I think it's really opaque because a lot of it has been financed by private equity. And yesterday, the Bank of England warned that private equity could start the next crisis. But uh, what's on my mind that uh, seems to be maybe a little bit off the radar right now is that Larry Fink uh, seems to be uh, commenting a lot on uh, pensioners or retired people and the fact that uh, there's not enough savings out there anymore. And, and I, I I find that really uh, funny because a few years ago, Bernanke used to say that there was a savings glut 
And the only reason there was a savings glut is that they were buying uh, bonds like crazy QE, and that made the value of bonds and all, all other uh, securities and assets go up like a you know, the everything bubble. So yeah, people had a lot of wealth, but now that rates are going up, you've got uh, Larry Fink saying, oh, maybe people should start, you know, work longer. We can't have people uh, work only till they're 65. So I, I think um, even though Larry Fink is not in the UK, he's very influential everywhere. So yeah, my worry right now for the average person out there is that they're going to come after your pension or are they going to like delay um, the payment of your pension that you, you're entitled to? And I think you're entitled to because you you contributed to it. But unfortunately, in, in the current world that we live in, all those contributions have been stolen and debased. So yeah, I, I think that's something that they could come after. Um, and the baby boomers are a huge part of things. So yeah, I think the pensions, uh, and that's another reason why I think you need to have a, a bit of uh, assets outside this financial system. Well, gentlemen, it's been an awesome conversation. A lot of things to worry about. The silver lining of this interview is Mario, your dog, Rudy, has made a cameo, which I love back there on the couch. My wife loves Rudy. Whenever I tune into your program, she's always checking in to see what's Rudy up to today. Um, so that's lovely. Uh, before I do let you both go, Jack, tell us about Nobody Special Finance and what it is you do there. My channel. It's called Nobody Special Finance. I do a live stream every morning at 9 a.m. Eastern time before the market opens up. I also do regular videos uh, and I kind of dabble in investigative journalism, if it will. I've been covering an awful lot, the commercial real estate collapse and the AI mania. And uh, pay attention to what is going on behind the scenes in AI mania, folks. Everybody is just looking at the stocks and the numbers going up. There are so many obvious signs. Case in point, farm bro Martin Shkreli decided to go on Twitter the other day and tell the world what an idiot I am being suspicious of things that are going on in AI mania. So the most hated man in the world is telling you, a convicted fraudster is telling you everything's fine in AI. Take from that what you want. I got no horse in this race. I have no exposure to any of those stocks either way. But Pharma Bros says it's a great investment. So good luck with that one. Yeah. <laughs> Mario, tell us about Mineco64, your channel, and what it is you discuss there. Yeah, I'm on YouTube, of course, at Maneco64. Uh, I'm the home of alternative economics and contrarian views. I, I worked in the financial markets for over 20 years, and I try to uh, educate the public of how the markets work. And uh, my main mission, though, is to try to tell people uh, about how fiat currencies are, are doomed. And uh, I'm not trying to tell people to put all their uh, savings into gold and silver. But it's good insurance, and that's the the major gist of the work that I do. And I, I publish a video every day, and I do one live stream uh, on Sunday uh, where I uh, try to answer as many questions as possible from the viewers. Great. Well, I'll put links in the description below to both Nobody Special Finance as well as the Maneco 64 YouTube channel. Gentlemen, once again, it's been great. Thank you so much for coming back on the show. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks, Mario. Thanks, Jesse and Jack. And uh, you're welcome, uh, Jesse.